I resisted. I saw the delusion. The history of this galaxy is an open book to me. I prefer to look to the future, to navigate the future. And my collection is the story of everything. The characters and stories are the best part of the Warhammer experience and we all have the ability to create our own with the tabletop minis. From custom chapters to gorgeous paint jobs, creating our miniatures is a fantastic experience. So why not take them to the next level? From flush fit basic magnets for safe transportation to posable flight stands, the Magnet Baron offers a fantastic range of miniature hobby equipment. Looking to upgrade your force? The Magnet Baron is offering a giveaway of their fantastic Magnetization Starter Bundle. The perfect piece to get you started upon your magnetization journey. Details for the competition in the description below. Thank you The Magnet Baron for sponsoring this video. Existentialism is possibly the most onerous imposition of life. The need to ask why, to find some explanation. War and strife affect all known societies, and all species spend their existences competing with others for limited resources. From the cries of an infant to the wretched stench of the aged dying in their own filth, life is a series of squabbles and ugly messes. There is an alternative. There exists a state in which all conflict is resolved, and all is cold and silent. There are no wants, no wars, no squabbles. You may call this state death if you wish, but that is a misnomer. Death is but the ending of life, and that is only a means to an end. That end is purity. The time when all is still and unchanging. Our universe began in purity and it will return to that blessed state. Hastening that return is the great work of perfected beings. I have awoken and you have tried to undo our great work. You have spread your vile, unclean selves across the galaxy, making a mockery of the beautiful silence we had wrought. It was all in vain. Rejoice, for we have returned, and your days are at an end. History requires two parties, the historian and their audience. Without that, one is just talking to oneself. So kindly stop screaming, and you might learn something. Sion of the Nihalak dynasty, overlord of Solemnace, Trazen the Infinite. A figure of mischief, a preserver of histories, artifacts and events, and a thorn in the side of all races within the galaxy. Wherever Trazin treads, mayhem and destruction follow in his wake. But he does not pillage the galaxy unchallenged, for there is one who equals this cosmic curator, a rival. Only the most parochial beings think that stars twinkle. That is an illusion of atmosphere, an observation of one who has never traveled space. The stars do not wink at us, they burn. They are unlidded eyes boring into us with their gaze. The cryptic astromancer, scion of the Saltek dynasty, Orican the diviner. Across the various courts of the Necron Empire, a name is spoken with equal scorn and reverence, as many seek the divinations of this legendary cryptic. From the time long before our species stood upright, Trazin and Orokin roamed the galaxy, born into a galaxy millions of years ago. But who are they now? What journey have they endured up to the 41st millennium? Their story begins over 60 million years ago. At the very edge of the galaxy, 
inside the cold and distant region known as the Halo Stars, sentient life had risen up. Amongst the dirt and filth, a humanoid race had evolved to the apex of their world. A planet filled with fascinating and deadly creatures that roamed the world's vast deserts. The Necron Tear. A race so similar and yet so different from humanity. The Necron Tear created a complex and rich society. They spread across their world, building bastions and realms that would make us shudder in their enormity and grandeur. Advancements in technology flowed from these gifted people. They delved into the darkest corners of science and engineering, unlocking the very secrets of the galaxy. The Necrontier people were ambitious and had that innate will to dominate and conquer. But this drive did not come from a place of excitement and adventure. It came from desperation. For the millions of years it took the Necron Tear to evolve, the species had been dealt an awful hand as their world suffered under the deadly warmth of unfiltered radiation. Assailed at every moment by ionizing solar winds and intense radiation storms, the Necron Tear suffered greatly. Life for the Necron Tear was a short, painful experience. Baking under the light of an unforgiving star, cancers and radiation sickness were commonplace in Necrontier society. Imagine living your whole life, constantly on the edge, as you await the day that you know your death is coming, and there is nothing you can do about it. Death. Death was a release from this painful existence that was the life of the Necrontier. The dead had achieved their glory and had fulfilled their purpose and now had the sweet release of death. The Necron Tear venerated them. Their myths and legends formed around entities inspired by aspects of death, suffering and power. As if life could not be punishing enough for the average person, Necron Tear society was a reflection of its harsh environment extremely hierarchical. To be a ruler, a Pharon or Ferak, was akin to becoming a god. These great dynasties were the pillar, the excellence, the fulcrum in which everything would be built around. The common people were the branches on the fire of Necrontier ambition. The staunch difference in their values was reflected in their obsession with death. Great tomb complexes were constructed for the various dynasties. To put yourself before these palaces of death, you would be daunted by their size and their opulence. For the billions who toiled under their cruel sun, working on the opulence of the nobility, a dirt mound would be considered a luxury. Most dying unremembered and forgotten in a society obsessed with those who had already passed. For all its wonder and advancement, the Necron Tear way of life was harsh, crippling disparity between the powerful and the powerless, cancers and radiation sickness running rampant. Through millennia of sacrifice and innovation, the Necron Tear finally sailed to the stars, creating spacefaring vessels to explore the galaxy. Generations upon generations spread across thousands of worlds. The ruling dynasties conquered and expanded their realms. The infinite empire was a titanic conglomerate of power, all centralized under one, a silent king. Hope had existed within the stars for the Necron Tear, finally reaching worlds that did not suffer under the constant radiation their species had suffered through. But after millennia, with all their research and innovations, they hit a dead end. The Necron Tears DNA was irrevocably damaged. They were condemned to suffer the cancers and the growths for eternity. Generations upon generations of exploration and new Necron Tear born far away from their homeworld had forged these vast realms, each controlled by the numerous powerful dynasties. 
but in a society that rewarded power and greed. The ties of unity were thin, and so the Necrontir suffered the worst kind of plague for centuries. War. The Necrontir known as Trazin and Orokin were born in a time of cold and hot war. The paranoia, the scheming, the conflict was daily life. Spread across the stars, the Necron dynasties had begun to fracture and splinter from the rule of their silent king. Civil war flared within the ever-fracturing society. The greedy and powerful dragged in the ordinary people into their petty wars. The ruling Triarch Council could see the collapse on the horizon and chose a path they felt could unite their people once more. A common enemy. The Old Ones. An ancient and highly technological and physically advanced intelligent species. The children that were Trezin and Orokin were born in the aftermath of the cataclysmic war known as the War in Heaven. The story was told to the infants born into luxury inside the great fortresses of their dynasties. The immortal Old Ones had refused to save their people and cure them of their diseases. They refused to share the secrets of immortality. The Triarch Council's War in Heaven united the great dynasties. They were going to take the secrets from the Old Ones. But they were defeated at every turn, outmaneuvered and overwhelmed. Scores of generations lived and died in the service of an unwinnable war. And many Necrontir dynasties would have gladly sued for peace with the Old Ones if the ruling Triarch had permitted it. The Necrontir were pushed back to their homeworld, billions crammed onto the overpopulated surface. The Necrontir and the dynasties had lost nearly everything they had gained from generations upon generations of work. It would be under the Necrontir's cruel sun once again that Trazin and Orokin grew. Waking every morning and following the Necrontir's ritual of checking for cancers every day, waiting for the day they knew death was coming. Trezin, scion of the Nihalak dynasty, was born into comfort and luxury. The Nihalak dynasty at their height had vast treasure worlds, filled with the wealth plundered from lost civilizations. A dynasty that flaunted its wealth and yet defended it with a miser's zeal. Trezin grew under the tutelage and culture of this great house rising to the role of scribe and chief archivist, overseeing the mummification of Necrontir Pharons. Trezin spent his life at the royal court of the Silent King, recording the legends, the history and the stories. He buried great kings and queens amongst finery and inside behemoth tombs. Imagine witnessing these greatest moments, the greatest feats and culture of your civilization. It's beauty. History requires two parties, the historian and their audience. And the Necrontir Trazin of the Nihalak dynasty reveled in playing both parts. Yet for all his renown and reverence at court, one was a constant thorn of an annoyance in his side. Orican, scion of the Sautek dynasty. To be a Sautek was to breathe the life of a warrior. Martial combat and strategy were sacred and were pillars of their culture. Orican, perhaps unlike Trezin, did not fit so neatly into the ideals of his elders. For Orican had been born weak in body. Martial training was forced upon him as he grew, training within the Immortals Warrior Temple. But for the young Orokin, it would be his mind where his strength lie, and so he was permitted to pursue the path of a cryptic. The very scientific fundamentals opened to Orokin, 
as he studied within the cryptic conclaves, mastering his understanding of science and technology on a level that would astound us. But out of years of study, he specialized in the astromatic discipline, delving into the mysteries of time itself. The future became his obsession, an outlook that brought him into conflict with one in particular at the royal court, Trazin. The two Necrontier squabbled and clashed, worldviews clashing over the pettiest of squabbles that a life in nobility allowed. But everything would change with the words brought to them by their silent king. The Necrontier were about to face their most defining moment. The Silent King, Zarek, ruler of the Necrontier Empire, presented to the royal court a discovery that would change them forever. The Catan, imprisoned by the Old Ones upon their homeworld, cursed to endure their sickly existence, the Necrontier were locked within a cold war between the various dynasties. The new Silent King Cesarek's authority hanged by a thread. Their future was bleak. All Necrontier from Trazin and Orican in high nobility, to the lowly commoner, they were angry. They were the Necrontier. They were destined to conquer the stars, to escape the hell that they had been born into. It was at this zenith of hate and pain that the Necrontier detected a mysterious anomaly orbiting their cursed star. With their advanced technology, they could see something was wrong. Something seemed to be feeding upon their star, draining its energy. They had found life, something beyond anything they had seen before. The power of these starborn creatures was incredible. The raw energy of stars made animate, and the Necrontier called them the Kitan, or star gods in their own tongue. The Kitan was spread across areas larger than whole planets. Their very thoughts and consciousness clashed with the material universe. Some would say it was the collective hatred of an entire species that drew these star gods to their world. But the truth would forever remain a mystery. Whispers began to spread throughout Necrontier society that these gods, their gods, their mythological history had manifested. The Necrontier Royal Court constructed a device designed to communicate with these etheric beings. But with no tether to the material universe, it was like communicating with a raging inferno. They couldn't speak to these gods unless they manifested them within a material form. Some of the Necrontier actively sought the Kitan's favor and oversaw the forging of physical shells for the Kitan to occupy. Cars from the living metal called Necrodermis, creatures of pure energy willingly poured themselves into these cages, and a new state of consciousness awakened. To Trazin and Orican and all the other Necrontier at the royal court, it must have been incredible to see. To witness something so powerful would fill anyone with fear and reverence. The Kitan began to enjoy these new forms, and over time they began to slowly shift. Resembling the mythological gods of death, the Necrontir had worshipped for generations. To Trazin, he perhaps felt more that sense of wonder and appreciation, the artistry of these godlike beings' forms. As a scribe, he had the responsibility to record the very words of gods. Perhaps even being there, the Silent King Zarek informed the court of a proposition from these star gods. The Kitan Mephet Ran came to Zarek and whispered to him about the Kitan's story, how they had been hunted by the cruel old ones 
and that they desired vengeance. Mephit Ran offered Zarek immortality for the Necron Tear. No longer would they have to suffer in the fear of looming death by cancerous growths. No longer would they live such short, miserable lives. They could claim the galaxy like their forebearers and take vengeance on the old ones who had killed and imprisoned them. The Kitan's charisma was astounding. For weeks the royal court debated this offer. Only one voice spoke in protest to this seemingly generous offer, Orican. As an astromancer cryptic, Orican's power gave him insight into the future. The various paths and webs that splayed out from moments like the one the Necronteer faced. Orican could see no future in which Mephit Ran's words held true. The proud scion of the Sautek dynasty, despite being weak of body, had their spirit, and rebelled against the idea of fully trusting these so-called gods. The dissenting voice was drowned out. Zarek had made his decision, and how could he not? Could you endure the shame of defeat? Could you wake every morning, patting down your body for the first sign of disease? Could you turn away from immortality? Across their homeworld, Necronteer painted in red, once executioners in sacrifice for their old gods, now dragged the people in their billions for their new ones. Trazin, the now old, hunched over elder, who needed his cane just to move, was taken from his library in chains. Orican the Cryptic dragged from his temple in chains, protesting and raging against the madness they were committing. The two Necron tears struggled against their bindings. The willing and the unwilling were going to experience apotheosis, whether they liked it or not. Billions of Necronteer made an exodus, with swords at their back, towards enormous towers, whose fire lit up the night sky. From the young to the old, even the children were pushed like a line towards hell itself. Some of the sick and dying Necronteer, riddled with disgusting cancerous growths, died in the sand, stepped over by the billions marching. Trezin and Orokin were right there, in the middle of it, their respective dynasties pushed either by greed or chains. Above these towering furnaces the Kitan flew above, creatures that resembled their old gods. It must have been a nightmare to witness such an imposing view. As Trezin and Orokin stepped closer, they could feel the heat, they likely heard the screams as thousands by the minute entered the bio-furnaces. And then it was their turn. Trezin and Orokin pushed into the fire. Their skin and bones immolated. Pain flushed through every nerve within their body. Their screams were drowned out by the roar of the fire. This would be the last physical sensation they would ever feel. Trezin Scion of the Nihalak dynasty, and Orican, scion of the Sautek dynasty, died. The scribe and chief archivist, and the astromancer cryptic were no more. Within the roaring fires of the biotransference chamber, all that they were before was harvested, condensed into information. Their personalities, hopes and dreams, their quirks, all data. Within this chamber of fire and pain, a skeletal parody of the Necronteer formed from the living metal Necrodermis. The information of Trezin and Orokin imprinted upon these new forms, settling into their cores. The two marched out from the fire. They were no longer Necronteer. They were now the Necrons, Trezin and Orokin. There exists a state in which all conflict is resolved, 
and all is cold and silent. There are no wants, no wars, no squabbles. You may call this state death if you wish, but that is a misnomer. Death is but the ending of life, and that is only a means to an end. That end is purity, the time when all is still and unchanging. Trezin and Orokin had been changed fundamentally. They had become immortal. No sickness or age would blight them. They had discarded the weakness of flesh. They would never again suffer under their cruel sun and experience the dreaded cancerous growths. But yet something was wrong. It was like a part of them was missing. It was cold and silent within. They were lesser. As they looked to the sky, they saw the truth of the horror that had just happened to their entire species. Above each furnace they saw the swelling forms of the Catan, gorging themselves in the life energy and emotions of an entire species. Since their transformation from pure energy to material forms, the Catan had awakened a sense of hunger something that feeding on stars couldn't satisfy. The Catan had developed and acquired a new taste. They fed on the negative emotions of sentient life, and the wailing death cries of an entire species was a banquet. The Necron Tear had been deceived, their very souls taken, placed within Trezin, Orokin, and every Necron had been embedded protocols, granting Zarek programmed loyalty, and it was only those of high rank within the various dynasties who could comprehend the horror. For those who had no importance or noble blood, they had become simply mindless automatons. Zarek now understood the crashing weight of what he had agreed to, swirled with the power of an entire species, the Catan orders Zarek to prepare for war. Vengeance had been promised to the Necrons, and it was going to be delivered at the steps of the Old Ones. The war in heaven renewed. Trezin and Orokin under the command protocols headed to war, witnessing and participating in the most titanic clashes the galaxy had ever seen. A war that saw the Necrons and Catan ravaged the galaxy. Entire races were extinct under the feasting of the Star Gods. The Necrons had expanded, conquering and constructing an empire that eclipsed the one of their ancestors. But after countless years, the resentment of their betrayal had never diminished, it had only festered. It was a war that began in betrayal for the Necrons, and it will be one that ended in it too. The Catan had promised everything, eternal life, revenge and power, but they had taken what it meant to be alive, to be Necrontyr. No new Necrontyr would ever be born again. They were finite to gods that treated them like ants. Trazin, Orokin and Zarek hated them, and vengeance would be theirs. decay, the woods decay and fall. The vapors weep their burthen to the ground, man comes and tills the field and lies beneath, and after many a summer dies the swan. Me, only cruel immortality, how can my nature longer mix with thine? Coldly, thy rosy shadows bathe me, cold are all thy lights, and cold my wrinkled feet, upon thy glimmering thresholds, when the steam floats up from those dim fields about the homes of happy men that have the power to die, and grassy barrows of the happier dead, release me and restore me to the ground. Thou seest all things, 
thou wilt see my grave. Thou wilt renew thy beauty morn by morn. Immortality. Our life is consumed by the escape of death. We desire to create things that will pass a piece of us on after death. Family, religion, art, business, and even at times, pain. But what does it truly mean to be immortal? What does it cost? Only do you appreciate something's value when it is taken away. How can my nature longer mix with thine? Be jealous of happy men that have the power to die. For Trezin and Orokin, they had lived a life in a society built around the expectation and the anticipation of death. In a way it was revered. Even their gods were built around the mythology of those who had passed. But now they were Necrons. Death was not a sure thing anymore. When their bodies were destroyed, the Necrons' essence would simply return to their advanced monoliths, where a metal prison would be constructed, waiting for its host. The cost of their immortality showed in other ways too. Innate functions such as breathing or a beating heart were gone, and those like Trezin and Orokin, who had retained most of their personalities, sometimes caught themselves in a panic, unable to catch a breath where none existed, tricks and fears of the mind. The Necron nobility knew what Zarek had led them into, but they were bound by protocols to follow his orders. A king who was in turn threatened by the weight of a god's fury if he resisted. The sentient Necrons, Trazin, Orokin, Zarek, and the ruling dynasties hated the Gitan, hated how Mephit Ran had deceived them hated the truth of immortality. They hated being subservient to alien masters. A plan was conceived over countless years in the dark. Zarek plotted his revenge and his freedom for his people. As the war in heaven ravaged the galaxy, the Catan had become so powerful that they had begun to war with each other. It was at the height of this chaos that Zarek unleashed weapons so dangerous it would scar the galaxy and time forever. Trezin, Orokin, and the Necrons broke the so-called Star Gods, shattering them into shards. The pieces of these broken gods were imprisoned, used as the conduits in the Necrons' own technology and armies. The betrayers had been betrayed. It was with this final act that Zarek removed his command protocols. Trezin, Orokin, and the others would never again be under the forceful command of a silent king. The galaxy was ravaged, and in the wake of the Catan's defeat, one thing had become clear to those who delved into the mysteries of time. Orokin and the other cryptics foresaw the rise and dominance of the Eldari and knew that they could not stand against them. But they knew that the time of the Eldar would pass, as did the time for all born into flesh. Like their ancestors before them, the Necrons constructed great tombs in which they would be laid to rest, preparing for the day that they would rise again. Trezin, Orokin, and all the other Necrons entered into stasis crypts and the various worlds held under the noble dynasties. They were captured in a moment of unbelievably slowed down time. An entire race slept. The galaxy spun around for over 60 million years. Civilizations rose and fell. History, dramas and moments played out upon the surface of thousands of planets unaware of the sleeping metal skeletons that lie beneath. It was some time within the 20th millennium, on the world of Solemnace, a tomb stirred. After 60 million years, Trezin of the Nihalak dynasty awoke. He was surrounded by a universe that was unfamiliar to him. Parallel to his stirring, on the world of Mandagora, a certain Astromancer Cryptek too stirred from his tomb. Orokin, 
The two Necron had awoken early, millennia before their predestined time of awakening. The Eldari had fallen. The galaxy was overrun with Xenos only seen within the deepest channelings of the cryptic temples. There was no great war, no great mission, no Pharon to serve. The two Necron found that they had time. A meaningless concept to an immortal, but an advantage against those who still slept. What would you do with limitless time? What would you explore? What objectives would you set? What would be your magnum opus? Trazin and Oregon began to craft their great objective, each manifested from the ideas that had formed from the time of flesh, and it would be the conclusion of those ideas that reignited the greatest rivalry in the galaxy. Archivist. Oricon paired the greeting with a polite bow. It achieved the proper depth and angle for a greeting of equal colleagues, but remains just shallow enough to communicate contempt. Astromancer, said Trazin, returning the bow with a nod, the proper gesture for an overlord greeting guests on his world, serving as both welcome and a warning. It was, consequently, identical to a dueling bow. Had you announced your arrival, I would have arranged an honor guard. A figure of your reputation should not be wandering here alone. Kind and proper, my colleague, kind and proper. Oricon moseyed sideways, insectile. But I would not trouble you, especially since for a planetary overlord, you are often away from Solemnes. They were circling each other now, Pretense dissolving, they'd long been rivals, back to the times of flesh, and Trezin had frequently imagined what it would be like to land a blow on the Diviner. But Oricon's movements unnerved him. The curse of biotransference had made parodies of them all, but none more extreme than he and Oricon. While Trezin had been remade into a hunched, hooded thing, a scholar eternally at his work, Oricon's slight frame had twisted to reflect the soul within. He was all things quick and venomous. His face and headdress recalled a hooded serpent. His curled tail, segmented back armor, and spindly limbs echoed the waste scorpions of the old capital. Divination orbs ran down his spine, swirling with the cloudy energy. A single, baleful ocular, mocking the foresight the Cryptops claimed to possess, gleamed with haunty malice. Thievery is beneath you, Oricon. Hand back the trinket and perhaps we can continue your research under supervision. After all, I of all beings can understand the wish to covertly acquire- Understand? Oricon snapped. To understand is not in you, Trazim. You're a bird building a nest with shiny things. A child with a rock collection. You want things simply to have them. Their true meaning, their use, is lost on you. Hurtful, chided Trezin. He dipped his obliterator so it pointed at the device in Oricon's hand. Even if true, I see no reason why that allows you to steal my things. You stole it first. From the Amunos dynasty. The Amunos dynasty is not but inert metal now. You can't steal from the dead. That's called archaeology. The point is to memorialize, learn, study what came before us. We look to the past to navigate the future. I prefer to look to the future to navigate the future, said Oricon. For instance, there were 27 times I could have attacked just now, but none would have got past your guard. Indeed? But 28 is a slaying blow. Stop, Trezin pleaded. The ancient pipes shattered. Bowls that once held dream tar husbanded in front of temple gardens, scattered broken amongst the feet of the lich guard, who froze in mid-step, torn between the command to advance and the one that prevented them from damaging the artifacts. Oricon put his shoulder against a case of surgical instruments and heaved grabbed a disintegrating scroll and threw it across the chamber of antiques, his own warding circle of defacement, 
the Lich Guard halted, awaiting orders. If you wish to treat with me, scribe, sneered Orokin. Come inside. Trazen obliged, vaulting the debris, channeling power through his leap, his obliterator swinging down like a great hammer. It drove down an Orokin staff, the iron clang of their meeting echoing off the walls. For an instant, the lodestones of their weapons touched, sizzling and popping like power cables in water. Trezin shoved the diviner backward with the haft of his obliterator, then the staff swirled and clashed again, wheeling so fast that they left spectral fans of energy in their wake. Vandal! Trezin roared, thrusting his obliterator like a spear. You have destroyed objects made by craftsmen dead long before we breathed, pieces of our past that can never be remade. Orokin parried, rolling the blow upwards and leaping sideways to avoid the downward chop that followed it. Useless things, fetishes of vanished past. Trezin reversed his obliterator and slapped the staff into Orokin's side, staggering the diviner. The chronomancer backpedaled. Wisps of radioactive aura twisting from the burn in his lower thorax. Trezin came on again, his fury burning. Circuits flared hot. Viscous electrofluid pumped through his systems like magma. Pleasure to me is wonder, the unexplored, the unexpected, the thing that is hidden and the changeless thing that lurks behind superficial mutability, to trace the remote in the immediate, the eternal in the ephemeral, the past in the beauty, the infinite in the finite, these are to me the springs of delight and beauty. To achieve the essence of real externality, whether of time or space or dimension, one must forget such things as organic life, good and evil, love and hate, and all such local attributes of a negligible and temporary race called mankind have any existence at all. Time is a weapon like any other, if all else fails. I can simply wait for my enemies to rot. It is the 30th millennium, and upon the world of Solemnes, two old men bicker and squabble with all the grace of children. An argument that began millions of years ago echoes into the present. Engage in a duel that if done within the time of flesh, would have been an embarrassment beyond all proportions. Trezin and Orokin's rivalry had been reignited. But what could possibly bring two of the greatest minds within the Necron race into such petty conflict? It all came down to the priority and perception of their existence within the universe. The future. The key. Something on the mind of everyone. We plan for it. We dream about it. The number of pathways and possibilities are endless. To one such as a Necron, the present has become almost meaningless in the face of the importance of the past and the future. Orokin, the now coined diviner, looks only in one direction. Why predict the future when he could reshape it? But to what end, what ambition did this immortal cryptic desire? Ascension. To achieve the essence of real externality, whether of time or space or dimension, one must forget such things as organic life, good and evil, love and hate. Orokin within his deepest meditations had discovered something incredible, a state in which he transformed himself and detached himself from the very universe, becoming almost a spirit-like entity. He was free from the concerns of the material, Stars, worlds and fields of space dust smeared technicolor across the dark skies. Knowledge and information ran like rivers around him. This was the future. 
Orokin could see a universe in which all the Necron cast off their metal prisons and became something more. This etheric state could never be maintained for long, and the return to reality must have been a sombering experience. For the boy who was born weak to a dynasty consumed by the ideals of personal strength and martial ability, it was clear that he never quite fit in. An introverted and introspective cryptic who was lost within the study of time, annoyed by the bustling and crampedness of his home. He had been born a Necron tear, destined to experience a cruel, slow death, riddled with cancerous growths, and even as a Necron, he had lost his soul and existed within a metal prison. Perhaps it was easy to see why one who had gone through all of this would be all too eager to escape the confines of the material universe, to trace the remote in the immediate, the eternal in the ephemeral, the past in the present, the infinite in the finite. These are to me the springs of delight and beauty. It was a worldview that exclusively looked forward, an ideal that fundamentally clashed with his rival, Trazin, the now coined infinite. They were complete opposites, one to preserve and one to predict. Trazin's focus was to the past, to history. The universe is an enormous place. Within millions of worlds lie its wondrous creations and events. As a scribe and archivist, Trazin had spent a lifetime recording the drama, the culture, and the words of his civilization. As a Necron, Trezin had been there at the forefront of the war in heaven. He had seen the various races created by the Old Ones, their beauty and their horror. He adored watching history, wishing perhaps that he could take the moment and encapsulate it, preserve it for others to witness their wonder. Upon the world of Solemnes, Trezin began to enact that very idea. Solemnes was an artificial construct, a planet-sized Dyson Sphere whose outer shell consisted of untold amounts of nano-machines, a great prize to an overlord of the Nihalach dynasty. Trazin began his collection. It had started with a section he loved and dreaded, the War in Heaven. From the ancient Eldari to the Krog, Trezin had captured some of the deadliest creatures in the galaxy, but trinkets and items of culture were just as important. Rare artifacts, carvings, paintings, and even towering structures made their way into the galleries of Solemnes. It was a masterpiece. It was history, and its importance could not be forgotten for he truly believed that it was our past that shaped our future. Which is why, during the early 30th millennium, he was horrified when the intruder Orokin broke his rare collection of early Necron-tier pottery. Orokin had taken years to infiltrate his rival's so-called museum in search of an artifact that would change everything. The Asterium Mysterios. We must not let the relics of antiquity be broken and crushed by the savagery of unenlightened creatures. For only by understanding these treasures may we conquer the future. Only we, who have broken free from the shackles of mortality and bound the infinite majesty of the cosmos to our will, can be trusted with this task. That is why we are here, on this wretched pit of a planet. Eliminate these immortals as you see fit, but do try to keep the collateral damage to a minimum. With any pretense of courtesy fading, the two Necrons clash within the exhibit of Solemnes' galleries. Trezin had become powerful over the millennia, due in part to the very use of selected Xenos and Necron artifacts, in which he would assure anyone he obtained through proper procedure. His weapons were as equally as deadly as his cunning. His empathic obliterator had been crafted with the technology of the Old Ones, 
and was deadly to even the strongest of foes. Paired with his ability to almost immediately transfer and assume control of any lower tier Necron, made his death a frustrating goal to achieve. Orokin was equally just as deadly. His transformation from Orokin the Necron tier to Orokin the Necron had increased his cryptic powers exponentially. All powerful and important Necrons had the gift of Chronosense, able to slow time briefly internally, an incredible tool for crafting complex strategies and tactics. But as perhaps the most gifted Astromancer Cryptek their species had to offer, Orokin's ability to manipulate time was incredible. Able to maintain his chronosense for centuries in meditations, he could send his consciousness back to himself minutes in the past, making him able to nearly control the flow of combat and negotiation. In the museum on Solemnace, their clash was a mix of parlor tricks, backhanded remarks and devastating weaponry. What had reignited their rivalry was an ancient Necron tier artifact known as the Asterium Mysterios, forged in the mind of the genius Datamancer Vishani in the time of flesh. This ancient device had been crafted as a map, leading to a treasure that was beyond priceless to both the infinite and the divine. It had been acquired by Trezin long ago, and he would most certainly assure you it was through noble means. It was a crowning piece in Trezin's galleries, but it was so much more. It was rumoured to hold the location to the overlord Nefreth the Untouched. A necrontier said to have been immune to the sickness of radiation. His tomb possibly held the key to the transformation of the Necron race. Something Orokin desired to enact, and something Trezin desired to display. Orokin stole the Asterium Mysterios from Solemnace, breaking precious Necrontier artifacts in the process. Trezin howled for vengeance, even going so far as to have the matter brought before the awakened Necron Council, a petty mood for an annoyed old man. The two before the awakened Council argued like children, speaking over each other, exposing holes in the other story fighting over a tomb that's very existence was a myth seemed like a joke to the council but who amongst them could really say a consequence of the reawakening had meant their memories of the time of flesh were uncertain trezin and all the others knew all too well the cost that biotransference and the subsequent reawakening had cost them what the katan had cost them the two old Necrons were not afraid to deliver low blows. Orokin even dared to send his consciousness back multiple times throughout the debate, each time overwriting when he had had an unfavourable outburst. He even resorted to reminding the Council of his dynasty's wrath, should they be too biased in one way or another. He could, after all, summon Imhotek the Stormlord a Necron of unparalleled power, strategic might and prowess, a crowning jewel of the Sautek dynasty, a threat not taken lightly. Orokin was many things. He was reckless, but not dull-witted. Casually admitting to an atrocity or a crime here and there, the council was disgusted with the two's behaviour. They declared that the Asterian Mysterios belonged to all Necron, and thus the list of rivals and enemies grew exponentially. The race for Nefref's tomb had truly begun. Trazin. That damn bastard, always getting in the way, always putting his grubby fingers into the pockets of others. Orokin, in the possession of the Asterium Mysterios, could not help but have lingering thoughts about how much the hunched immortal annoyed him. The way he would use his charm and careful selection of wording to weasel himself out of consequences. 
His very existence was frustrating. Orokin couldn't understand Trazen's mindset. The past was dead. His admiration for artifacts and culture of other primitive Xenos races. And on the other hand, Trazen's opinion of the Diviner was equally venomous, always giving his so-called predictions of the future. Though Trazin knew the truth, Orokin, though a skilled astromancer, his predictions were not always flawless, and unforeseen events could change his calculations. When a vision would play out differently to his so-called prophecies, Orokin would employ his closely guarded chronomatic abilities and travel backwards in time to make sure that his prophesied future events took place exactly as he had stated, even willing to go to the extreme of shaping future events around his visions in order to protect his so-called precious reputation. Always looking to the future was a mistake to Trezin. How could he navigate it without the context of the past? How could Orokin disregard the amazing creations within the galaxy? Could someone really be such a bore? With the statement of the Awakened Council, they had declared that the Asteria Mysterios and the Tomb of Nefreth, the untouched, belonged to all Necron. And so the war between immortals begun. Who knew how many rivals had been dragged into this race? Deep within his meditative state that took six years to delve into, Orokin finally found what he was looking for. He had cracked a code that only one with his level of mastery could possibly do. He had discovered a location, and it would be on the world of Serenade that would finally draw the two rivals together again. The world had already suffered the consequences of their rivalry millennia prior, as during the early 30th millennium, its inhabitants, an enclave of Eldari Exodites experienced a rather unpleasant visit from Trazin. Fighting his way into their innermost sanctums, Trazin had attempted to steal their most precious artifact, a world spirit gem, a relic of the war in heaven, a gorgeous, powerful piece, said to house the souls of thousands of Eldari. The Metal Glutton's treachery had been foreseen in prophecy, and the defenders of the world warned him of his recklessness, in spite of knowing that they would be ignored. Trezen even took a few of them for his collection on the way. The temptation had been too strong. It would be millennia later that the two rivals returned to the archipelago-rich world. The two clashed in multiple bitter duels over the temple gate, revisiting the world constantly, even as the world had begun to change over the years. Eldari, Orc, and even humans would find strange metallic skeletons invading randomly throughout the millennia. The constant skirmishes and betrayal of each other mounted in a clash directly in front of the infamous temple's portal. Orokin and Trezin dueled with legions of their forces, kicking and scraping away at each other. Orokin's mastery of Chronosense, and at times his etheric form, being pitted against Trazin's infinite number of body doubles, summoned Xenos from his collection and sheer conniving tactics. They had never been soldiers, and any semblance of ordered battle line had devolved into their strange version of war, influenced by their personalities. With the ringing clang of metal upon metal, they wrestled and struck each other with a bitterness fostered over millennia. The temple portal had been opened, and the two juxtaposing immortals were a fingertip away from greatness, from the prize they would burn worlds for, and then the temple portal closed. They had missed it. An override protocol thrummed through the chamber. Hundreds of Necron froze in place. The Awakened Council had come, and the two rivals were taken into custody. Before the Council, they were shamed for their childishness, pettiness, and dangerous behavior. Due to the unique properties of Serenade, any Necron that had died in the cavern could not be reanimated. Thousands of Necron had been lost, 
Of course they blamed each other, but the council had had enough. They were told that their feud had become out of hand, and now they would work together or be killed permanently. It's getting dark, Trezin said. Time to move. The pair translated to the crypt, and, enfolded in robes and with the illusion emitters lit, moved out into the city streets. They had to be more careful, now. Some spree killer had been active in Serenade City, and the enforcers were keeping a greater eye out, possibly using scanners. They skirted the edge of the square, avoiding the crowds, letting the emitters work with the shadows. As Orokin passed the stage where the players capered and juggled, he noticed a bizarre detail. That performer, the one with the tatty crown. King Mischief, yes. He has a third arm. Trazin smiled. Indeed, one of the performer's arms is false, I noticed. It allows his free arm to perform the mischief, picking pockets or planting incriminating evidence. A pickpocket, said Orican. No wonder you're interested. King Mischief, from the volumes I've read, is a saboteur who shakes up the social order and exposes hypocrites. The scripts are, I understand, tightly vetted by the administratum. They pass through the deep shadows, down the long stairs, and slopes of what was once Coral Shelf, and ascended into the abyssal, the sprawling slum built on the Great Plain below, a plain that had once been a sea floor before the orcs had pumped billions of drums of water out in order to cool their reactors, before the planetary government, while still riding high off denouncing the orcoid tyranny, realized that they could sell the water to passing imperial navy vessels and trade ships, thus opening new land for development. Now much of the ocean was gone, retreating into the smaller basin in the deep sea. Note, said Trezin. How even these bare hab blocks all have window boxes. Little gardens, vegetables, flowers. And each of them carved in the rune-like patterns inherited, knowingly or not, from the Eldari. Fascinating, isn't it? Short-lived vermin, borrowing from long-lived degenerates. I don't understand your fascination with humans, Trazen. I admit they have their poor qualities, certainly. Unrefined without question, superstitious, no doubt, and primitive, fractious and grasping as well. Besides, their biology is disgusting. Everything they consume for energy eventually kills them. Their digestive tracts are literal colonies of bacteria, and their reproductive system is the same as their waste elimination system. Did you know that? Orokin grimaced, as if he had not known it and preferred to live in a state of ignorance. It's true, Trazin insisted. I've done the dissections. Yet, despite all those difficulties, they've done a great deal in the galaxy. Their empire may, in time, eclipse the extent that ours was as its height. Perhaps it does already. They have not the coordination to tell. They are born weak, mature slowly, have short lifespans and in a galaxy packed with creatures that come into the world fully grown and armed with fangs and armored with bone, they have still managed to become the dominant force through technology and will. Trezin paused, as if weighing whether to trust Orokin with his next sentence. They remind me a bit of us, or rather, how we used to be. Ambitious, but short-lived. Orokin growled a displeased buzzing in his vocal emitters. We had greater technology, and their lives are much longer than ours were. Not by much, Trezin chided. Not really, particularly given that they cannot use stasis scripts during star voyages as we did. Oh, they artificially extend them with drug treatments and augmentics, or the awful surgeries of the Astartes. But that is a very small minority. Most are overall adjusted to their short lives. They consider it enough. They know nothing better, said Orokin with a note of bitterness. Our truncated, tumor-cursed lives had to be lived in the shadow of the immortal old ones. Before that, we too accepted our fate. Do you think that, given the choice, they would trade their souls for immortality as we did? As you did, said Orokin. I resisted. 
I saw the delusion. You were only too willing to trade in that broken body of yours. Trezin stopped. I went to the flames of biotransference in chains. It is distinct in my engrams. I can picture it with clarity. The lock collar around my throat. Metal hands, tireless, grasping my shoulders. They took me in my library. The one who did it, Nilkath, was a Sotek warden. One of the Stormworld's vassals. Orokin stared at him, ocular rotating, as if searching his death mask, looking for the telltale sign of power rerouting that might signal a lie. We remember it differently then, he said, and though Orokin's word often carried the lingering kiss of acid, these in particular burned. After all, you are the historical expert, are you not? The Diviner turned and they walked the rest of the six mile way in silence, arriving just before dawn. Ambitious but short-lived, Within the creature called humanity, most of these primitive Xenos were lucky to reach the age of 80, most residing in squalor and working back-breaking jobs. But these very people also created wonders, culture, art, an empire that spanned the entire galaxy. It was a reminder of the life that had been taken from the Necrons, from Trazin and Orokin, that ambition to live our life is consumed by the escape of death. We desire to create things that will pass a piece of us on after death. Family, religion, art, business, and even, at times, pain. This will of a species had formed the Necron Tear, and perhaps Trezin's fascination with humanity was a desire to relive that very ambition, that sensation of life. The very thing Orokin warned about losing when the treacherous Catan had whispered to their silent king. A worthy enemy is worth 100 tutors. The wisdom of the Necron Tear was true. Now forced to work together, despite both of their protests, the two rivals made astounding progress in the continuing quest for the tomb of Nefreth. The world of Serenade had changed more over the millennia, now home to a colony of the Imperium of Mankind. The world's very history had been affected by the meddling of both of them, Trezin even finding a statue made in his likeness, depicting his clash with an invading orc force millennia ago. Of course, the opportunity to rub it in Orokin's face could not be passed up. Did he have a statue made in his honour? Was he worshipped by Xenos? Perhaps if Orokin still could, he would have rolled his eyes. Nothing was worse than hearing Trazin gloat, or talk about how he eventually stole the statue too. Their research led them to discover a pattern with the very energy of the world itself. It thrummed, almost like a melody, chanting a binaric code. Orokin's own research in his deep meditative state had helped fill in the missing gaps and tightened their grip upon their goal. The Asterium Mysterios, forged in the mind of the genius Datamancer Vishani in the Time of Flesh, had been an incredible device. Through his trances, Orokin over millennia had begun to learn everything he could about it. The design and craftsmanship had imprinted onto his circuits a representation of its very creator, Data Mansa Vishani. This knowledge coalesced over millennia and had formed an almost consciousness-like state in his mind. It was as if he could speak to Vishani herself. Only one as skilled, in fact only Orokin wielded the mastery to perform this. Warnings. Revelations, questions, all began to be whispered to Orokin over thousands of years. Vishani urged him to unlock her mysteries. A prize beyond comprehension awaited. 
Trazin and Orokin next found themselves on another incursion onto Serenade. Information and protocol key in hand. Within the world's capital, Serenade City, Trazin was caught by the expression of culture, loving every second of it, even snagging a few trinkets for later display. It was during this time that Trezin uttered the words that truly shocked Orokin. I went to the flames of biotransference in chains. It is distinct in my engrams. I can picture it with clarity. The lock collar around my throat. Metal hands, tireless, grasping my shoulders. They took me in my library. The one who did it, Nilkath, was a Sautek warden one of the Storm Lord's vassals. Orokin could not believe it. Trezin was equally shocked when Orokin revealed that this was a lie. Trezin had volunteered. The archivist of the Nihalak dynasty, old and decrepit, had feared one thing. Not his body decaying or enslavement, but losing his mind, his inner library of history and culture. Trazin did not go to the furnace in chains. It was him. He had dragged Orokin in chains. Trazin was stunned. For all the differences between them, they were similar in some ways. Both highly talented, driven necrons, reckless and at times petty. They had beaten, tricked, sabotaged, even jumped out of portals and had shot at each other because clearly they deserved it. But they were never cruel. At least, Trezin thought he had never been. He apologized to Orokin. The biotransference had taken something precious from all the Necron. And if true, he was sorry. He was sorry he had participated in that very theft. The fact that Trezin had the ability to apologize likely shocked Orokin to his core. The time of flesh to all Necrons was like viewing an obscure dream. It seems the actions of Mephitran the Deceiver and the other Kitan had taken more than just their souls. They had taken their memories too. Trazin closed the massive tome. Disintegrating pages sending up a sandstorm of foul dust as it creaked shut. Mites ran in panic flight throughout the binding. No, no, not good enough. Must go earlier, I think. Coloma, please find me earlier volumes of They Drank the Seas. A copy from before the Inquisition censored Chapter 2. And anything you can find on subterranean building projects in that- Lord? Replied the ancient night librarian. He stood, spine bent from decades of pushing carts and shelving great volumes. Yes, librarian? I'm sorry to say that this will be my last night with you. Trezin looked up. Really? So soon? I had mentioned to you two years ago, my lord, that I was scheduled to be forcibly retired. But I paid for those augmentics, the hip and leg, the juvenats to keep her body together when it started to deteriorate. That was thirty years ago, my lord. I have grown old in your service, and it is not a question of willingness. Younger men in the librarium wish to move up, and they cannot while I hold my post. I see, said Trazin, looking the elderly night librarian up and down. He had not noticed in his deep focus, but he saw the truth of it. Colmer's skin was parchment thin, his gait unbalanced as his one fleshy leg had withered due to the strength of its metal mate. He wore a back brace laced over his yellow robes, brown eyes misted with cataracts. The right one so thick it was like the pupil peered through the sheet of vellum, regarding him with pained regret. How old had he been when Trazin first brought him into service? Twenty-five? Thirty? Young and vital, that was sure, quick of mind and strong of body, able to hoist volumes broad as his muscular shoulders and thicker than his forearms. Well, said Trazin, you had better sit then. Coloma sat, 
Slowly, Augmetic joints squeaked and stuck. He held his stiff natural leg out far to one side, wincing when the knee bent slightly. You have been a good and faithful servant, Coloma. And you a good master lord. My treatments, the hablock close to the library, my children educated in the good scolums, an ashbox in the garden of remembrance for my dear Maria. I owe you much. Trezin waved a hand as if dismissing the aid. Rewards are the fundamental mechanism of good leadership. Any master would do the same. My daylight masters in the Serenade Central Librarium did not. No, he admitted. Yours is a terrorized culture, my friend, and terror breeds obedience, but not loyalty. I have arranged for my replacement, Lord. I have been training him, a good man named Tova. Xander Tova. He will be here to serve you tomorrow night. Trazin nodded. You have given him the amulet. I have. Coloma confirmed. The mind shackle scarabs will have implanted themselves already. I saw it in his eyes during the shift change this evening. And you trained him personally. He is my nephew, Lord. I have prepared him for his duties. So the thing was done well, as Coloma ever had. He hoped that Tova would prove as able and enthusiastic, though if Coloma had groomed him, that was a good enough reference. The Scarrows would do the rest, though Coloma might have performed just as well without the application of their blunt force control. I will miss you, Coloma. And I you, Lord. You know, of course, that I simply cannot let you go. A faint flicker behind the cataracts. A rare instance of the scarabs asserting themselves. Of course not, Lord. I am a liability to your great work. I cannot promise it will be painless, but it will be fast. Thank you, Master. My life has been long and happy. I wish only to join Maria in the ash box. Good, said Trazin. He may not have been telling the conscious truth. But clearly on some level, Coloma wanted to die. The Scarabs had not needed to push hard. Had they done so, they might have killed the frail old librarian, which is not what Trezin wished. Despite his good service, Trezin had no desire to carry his body up from the basement. Then he went to his desk, sat down and folded his hands, looking at the portrait of his wife, gone over a decade now. When the stroke hit him, it was more painful than anything he'd experienced. But true to the word of his metal lord, it was over quickly. To see a world in a grain of sand, and a heaven in a wildflower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. A robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. Truth that's told with bad intent beats all the lies you can't invent. It is right, it should be so. Man was made for joy and woe. And when this we rightly know, through the world we safely go. When we see not through the eye which was born in a night to perish in a night. When the soul slept in beams of light. To see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand. Trazin understood the true experience of beauty. He reveled in it. We know that feeling, that overwhelming draw of emotion and wonder. It is a point in which the universe seems to rotate, as your complete and utter attention is captured. Trazin would often slow his chrono sense to its absolute limit just to appreciate those moments of discovery. Then, utilizing his tesseract labyrinths, 
a device that captured his intended exhibit into a pocket dimension, stuck in an unchanging moment. His galleries and solemn nays were filled with those moments of beauty. Creatures and Xenos that had made their mark upon Trezin and the galaxy. If one were to walk the city-sized halls of Solemn Nace, they would find all sorts of fascinating things. Mighty warriors from the war in heaven, ancient Eldari, a Krog, an ossified husk of an enslaver, a thunder warrior, even a Tau diplomat that was sent to negotiate with Trezin. An exhibit labelled the beheading of Goj Van Dyer, a custodian guard, even his infamous Eldari soul gem, taken from Serenade, and not to mention the numerous galleries dedicated to the Horus heresy. That had been a rather busy time for Trezin. This was what he'd loved, and he became lost within these moments. As an immortal, his perception of time had been altered, and he could be lost in thought for decades a consequence that he only realised with his immortal servants. How many had lived and died by his side through the passage of time. Trezin was himself a preserver, and though much of his species, like Orokin, thought of Xenos as nothing but primitives, things to be trampled under their desires, Trezin did not share this opinion, or at least not to the same extent. A device he often used amongst his servants and galleries was his infamous mind shackle scarabs, nano-sized automatons that fuse into the mind of the host, allowing a measure of mind control upon the victim. A safety precaution, he would assure you. But yet, despite this immoral act, the Overlord treated his servants well, like a craftsman who treated his tools with care. Trezin had a world filled with some of the greatest creations of the past. He had a galaxy to pillage and borrow from. Perhaps deep down he knew Orokin was right. Perhaps he had embraced the offer of immortality. But what the Catan had truly promised was not the immortal life they had been offered. And would Trezin give it up now? With the secrets that the rivals were hunting, it could be possible to return to flesh, to live a life in a new, healthy body, but would Trezin accept it? Orokin's own thoughts in a way mirrored the infinites. He had no desire to return to flesh either. The Necron could be so much more. He had achieved at certain times an, an etheric, energy-like state, an existence without the confines of the material where information and knowledge flowed around them like a river. This could have been the Necron Tears' future if Trezin had not dragged him in chains to the furnace. An understandable resentment that had wounded and bound the two for millions of years. Working together for millennia on Nefreth's tomb, the two have managed to somewhat find a mutual respect for one another even mutually saving each other's lives a few times. The world of Serenade was in danger. Millennia ago, the Astromancers had foreseen its destruction via Exterminatus, a consequence they only understood later to be a result of Trezin letting loose a gene stealer upon his rival. In his defense, it was not a serious hit, and it had been hilarious at the time. From that small mistake, a gene to the cult had formed in the back waters of the world, leading to a full-on uprising. The world had become a loss for the Imperium, and Exterminatus was coming. The two headed down to the location of another temple portal, but at the moment of glory, Orokin heard the whispers. Data Mansa Vishani, the voice of his closest friend, now my equal. Take the Asterium Mysterios. Trezin cannot go further. You cannot let him. Despite all the camaraderie and respect they had built working together, paranoia and greed overtook Orokin, and he lashed out. But in his desperation, Orokin's usual strategic composure was lost, and he was outwitted by Trezin. He was buried under a mountain of rubble. 
Trezin escaped, leaving Orokin entombed, trapped as the planet above was executed. Fabius turned slowly, taking in the ghostly images as they drifted thick upon the air. And what is the point of recording such a story if there is no one to appreciate it? Yet. What? No one to appreciate it. Yet. Trazin's metal fingers tapped against his staff. I am no more unique in this universe than you. We are outliers, true, but not the whole of the species. And when my folk awake from their slumber of eons, I shall have a story to tell them. He gave a rattling laugh. I doubt they will appreciate it, or even listen. But one does not expect gratitude from the masses. He glanced at his silent servants. Dull-witted things. Yes. Fabius studied the ancient being. How long have you been here? Longer than your race has possessed the ability to stand upright. You are immortal. I am persistent. Trizen indicated one of the hard light images. My race made a habit of persistence in the time of flesh. When faced with extinction, we chose instead a new way. The image swelled, and Fabius saw something. A strange entity of starlight and malice. It watched as legions of living things marched into the great furnace-like structures. The creatures were blurry, as if memory of them had been eradicated and all that was left was an absence. But what emerged from the burning heart of the edifices was easily recognizable. Thus Necron Tyr gave way to Necron, and we enslaved ourselves to infinity. Trezin rasped. Look at it, Fabius. Is it not wonderful and horrible? The star being rose, vaguely humanoid in shape, blazing with searing cosmic energies. Awful and breathtaking to behold. They ate stars, you know. And words besides. But we had the last laugh in the end. Trazin chuckled. We bound them in cages of harsh reality and used them to power our world engines. Like this place, you mean? Fabius said. One of those things is here. Yes, buried deep and safe. The crown jewel of my collection and the source of its power. Trezin laughed again. The source of my power. It began to pace, circling Fabius slowly, as if judging his merits. Fabius tensed. The creature had not taken his weapons or made any attempt to harm him. Despite that, he knew he was in danger. Madness, he said flatly. All of this madness. You boast of power, but you are nothing more than a thief. And perhaps not even that. Trezin stiffened. Are you the being you were before you were poured into the metal sarcophagus? Or are you merely the ghost of who and what you once were? Fabius turned slowly, keeping the pacing metal figure in sight. The same might be said of you. Are you even yourself, or are you merely a copy of a copy of a copy? The faded imprint of a thing long dead, Trazin said. Fabius froze. Yes, I know all about you, Fabius Bile. He stopped and thumped the floor with the ferrule of his staff. Perhaps I was wrong. Perhaps you lack the ability to conceive of true greatness. This galaxy is but a pale, shrunken husk of what it once was. Wonders and glories such as the human mind cannot comprehend. At best, you might glimpse a glimmer of its light, as if at the end of a great tunnel. Then why are we even having this conversation? Fabius leaned on torment. Why bother with this tete-a-tete -tete if you have concluded that there is such a gulf between us? I was curious. Fabius nodded in understanding. Be that as it may, I see no benefit to circling one another like territorial primitives. If you wish to kill me, do so and be done with it. Trezin made a hissing sound that might have been a snicker. I do not think that you would like that. I disabled your armor's cognitive pattern buffer. When was the last time you backed up your mind? Recently, I hope. 
else the next you might be at quite a loss. Fabius stiffened. You know. As I said, I know all about you. It is quite impressive. I use something similar, though vastly superior in design and function myself. That you were able to cobble together something so useful with such crude materials is commendable. The signal has a faint aftertaste. Eldari, I think. A variation on their infinity circuit technology. I like to think of it as a neural game of sorts, allowing for the flow of pertinent data between nodes. Fabius tapped the side of his head. Veins of specially cultivated wraith bone inserted into the unoccupied cerebellum of clone bodies allowed to flourish within set parameters. It acts as a sort of tuning fork, calibrated to a single frequency. Mine. Very clever, in a primitive sort of way. A cleverness motivated by necessity, I suspect. My sensors completed a thorough assessment of your biological status the moment you arrived. You are afflicted in a most pernicious way. The blight, Fabius said flatly. I am aware. No doubt. It always creeps back, does it not? It has buried itself so deep in your marrow that whatever soil you set your roots in rapidly goes sour. The stubborn beast flesh. Something. Someone. Whispered. Fabius twitched. I have made peace with my mortality. I persist only out of a sense of obligation. So I have heard. Paul disengaged his primary consciousness from the scryer's data screen and stared upwards. The inscrutable bulk of the pylon stood like a shadow against the strata of the cavern wall, defiant, mocking. Had he merely traded one world of obdurate secrets for another? Days of toil and not even a scintilla of progress. Had Veilwalker deceived him, or had he deceived himself? reading more meaning into her words than had truly been there. Was it all a grand distraction, waylaying his attention while she stole the reliquy? Kroll felt his rebreather quicken. He could not imagine why she would do such a thing. But what cause did Xenos truly need for malice? A familiar sensation crept across his sense filaments. He was not alone. It seems Cadia had yet more in common with Ariad 6 than he had expected. I projected your arrival before now, Veilwalker. Call turned, servo crawlers scuttling beneath him. The intruder was not the Shadow Seer. Green eyes blazed from beneath a hood of metallic scale. The power core of a burnished staff glinted. I mean you no harm. The figure cocked his head to one side. Are those the correct words? I find that no matter which I use, no one ever believes them. He paused. Wait, what did you call me? Secondary circuits meshed, retrieving ancient data. A Necron. A soulless embodiment of the motive force. A blasphemy against the Omnisire. Called Arc Scourge slithered to life, energy crackling across its coils. You are an abomination. The Necron set his staff aside. Thief normally suffices. I prefer honored guest. But abomination or thief, you and I have common cause. Call willed the Ark Scourge's tendrils to war mode, already anticipating the joy of dissection. Logic dictates otherwise. Then you don't seek to understand the nature of this matrix. The Ark Scourge grew still at Call's wordless command. This was unexpected, or was it the Abomination's trick to preserve its mockery of existence? You comprehend its secrets? I was there when they were first erected. Or perhaps I wasn't. You of all people should understand that memory is a fickle thing. Call aloud an angry hiss to rattle through his rebreather. We share no commonality. Perhaps. 
I went to the fires of biotransference in chains. You, I think, have gladly sliced away your humanity piece by piece. The Necron stepped closer, eyes blazing. But neither of us desires to see this galaxy ripped asunder by the Imperial ones. Destroy me if you wish, I will simply awaken elsewhere. Nothing will change. For me, for you, for this world. Call remains silent, probabilities warping and reforming with fresh data. First an Elder had set him on this path, now a Necron offered to guide his steps. But if the knowledge preserved the Omnisire's as Imperium... Show me. I thought you'd never ask. At the cavern's edge, Katarina Greyfax beheld Celestine's arrival with revulsion. How long had she been gone, that such heresy could take root? Battle sisters suffused with the power of idolatry, warriors of the Adeptus Astartes reveling in the corruption of their own mutations. Spirits wreathed in hellfire, and yet the loyal soldiers of Cadia and Ultramar, known across the galaxy for their unswerving devotion, their purity, embraced these evils in the name of victory. It was a cornerstone of Greyfax's certainty that evil had no shades, no lesser forms that could be tolerated in the service to a larger goal. Purity was perfection, uncompromising, ideal. She had killed thousands of lesser sins than this. She had killed her own kind for wavering from the path. What victory could there be if adamant precepts were torn asunder? The shadows reformed around her. Green eyes blazed. Greyfax aimed the muzzle of her contempt to bolt gun squarely between them. Abomination. That word again. A metal hand gestured lazily across the cavern. Stop me if this sounds familiar. But I suspect your priorities require re-evaluation. You sow corruption wherever you tread. Your reckoning is overdue. She pulled the trigger, or she tried to. Her finger didn't respond. Trezin opened his palm, a flood of microscopic machines flowing over his fingers. I am not a fool. The mind shackle will not let you harm me. Bile flooded Greyfax's mouth. Anger seared it away. You've corrupted me, as you did Valeria. Again, Greyfax tried to pull the trigger. Again, nothing happened. Useless. I brought you here out of common cause, said Trazin. I am not yet done with this world, and nor is your Imperium. If you seek to save it, I suggest you focus that formidable certainty of yours elsewhere. A reckoning will wait. With a snarl, Greyfax turned away. It is the late 40th millennium. Over three centuries ago, treacherous Orokin had tried to make off with the prize and steal the Asturian Mysterios. It had been an eventful time since Trezin had left his rival buried on the world of Serenade. With the unique physiology of the world, there was no reanimation or teleportation available to the Diviner. Waiting for the precious moment for when the temple's portal was destined to be opened, Trazin in the Infinite had been up to all kinds of mischief. He indulged in the activity that brought him endless joy, adding to his collection. Trezin tried twice to obtain the Spear of Vulcan from the Salamander's forge father Vulcan Hestan. An artifact forged by the hands of a Primarch would have been a most treasured prize. However, he was defeated in personal combat and was later foiled once again in the Totran Crusade, an entire combat he had orchestrated for the sole purpose of having another try against those pesky humans. He even ventured to the World of Harmony, a major base for the corrupted traitorous forces of the Emperor's children. His efforts to capture new additions for the galleries was thwarted, and he was wounded by Eidolon former captain of the Third Legion. But the ever-cunning and charming Trezin managed to barter for his life 
and offered up a lost gene seed tithe of the Emperor's children that was part of his collection, neglecting to mention how or when he had acquired such a thing. Accompanied by Fabius Bile, the accursed apothecary, he found within him something of a kindred spirit in a primitive way. Not that the Clone Lord could compare to the Infinite, but their innate curiosity had defined them both. His interest in the Clone Lord also bore fruit, and in exchange for his own life, Fabius offered a much more worthy prize to Trezin's collection. A perfect clone of the Primarch Fulgrim, the Phoenician. A truly glorious prize. Trezin had created a gallery that would be one of the greatest wonders in the galaxy, and he had created it for his people. When the Great Awakening came, and his people would all arise from the Great Sleep, here it would be, the history for all to enjoy. Though he knew not all would appreciate it, those such as Orokin and most of his mindless race, some would. The centuries passed, until finally the peace Trezin had been enjoying shattered. The bell of St. Gerstar, an Imperium artifact within the gallery, rang thirteen times. Each ring sent reverberation throughout Solemnace, destroying exhibits and even some of Trezin's surrogate bodies. Trezin was furious, angry at that stupid bell and the damage it had caused. Trazin investigated, and his research took him to Cadia, the Imperium's greatest bastion world next to the Eye of Terror warp rift. The 13th Black Crusade had begun, a massive invasion into real space by the denizens of the warp. Chaos, that horrific sea of madness used long ago by the Old Ones, were seeking to expand its influence into the galaxy. A threat to all, and especially the galleries. And in a way, the pool of things Trezin could collect. Trezin skulked in the shadows, quietly aiding the Imperium, activating the ancient Necron pylons, containing the expansion of the Eye of Terror. As the conflict escalated, he presented himself to the primitives in person. The contrast between himself and the infamous Archmagos Belisarius call was not lost on him. His crude augmentation of his form, how he strived to lessen his tethers to his base personality, something Trezin had feared losing himself long ago. The fact that he was called the Abomination. The threat of the Inferior Ones was greater than any disgust they had towards each other, and so Necron and Human joined forces. Trazin was unleashed. Tapping into his reserves, he unleashed his Tesseract Labyrinths. Warriors and heroes of the Imperium were unleashed onto a battlefield, each taken millennia from their own era. Even the infamous Inquisitor Greyfax, Toying with such a staunchly rigid specimen was often a delight, and it was a shame he could no longer toil with it. Like an overseer from the shadows, Trazin was like a death jester, toying with and countering the forces of the 13th Black Crusade. Chaos had been beaten at every turn, but these victories were for naught, and the enraged Abaddon launched the battered remnants of the enormous Blackstone Fortress ship at Cadia, cracking the very planet apart. It seems Trezin's time as a pseudo-saviour had come to an end, though he did not miss the chance to acquire some more rare specimens. kind have lived life as mortals, and then immortals. And though the urge to return to the flesh is nearly universal, what will it be like when an eternal being is once again enshrouded in such temporary raiment? 
Can an immortal being become mortal without going mad? The moment had arrived. The tomb of Nefreth the Untouched was ready to be plundered. It had been so long since his journey had begun. The very idea of what to do with the prize had even become unclear. Was Trezin obtaining the treasure because of what it represented? A return to uncorrupted flesh? Would he give up his immortality? Would he give up his mission to collect history? Oricon had been right millennia ago. Trezin was driven by one single purpose adding more and more to his collection. The lengths he had gone just to steal from others. The greed of a hoarder. And now that very greed had brought him back to Serenade for a piece that would crown his collection. In the shattered, cold ruins of Serenade, a world that Trezin and Oricon had all but destroyed because of the consequences of their actions, Trezin made his way down to the temple's entrance, Asterium Mysterious in hand. He stood before the gate, feverish with excitement at his upcoming prize. But then a voice cried out from behind, Oricon. Oricon had clawed his way through the stone and mud. Each time he got stuck, he had rewound his chronosense, starting over and over. What took three centuries in real time took over two millennia for Oricon. His necroderma's body was in ruins, almost overheated. He begged Trezin to stop, offering him anything he wanted. His time in the stone had shown him the truth, the song of the world, the signal that had started this all. The mad siren's song was accompanied by a second, subtle signal. A warning hidden by Data Mansa Vishani. Do not be deceived. But Trazin wouldn't listen, and he opened the gate. The tomb was real, and Trazin wanted it all. Oh, the beauty and the glory of it. And at the center of the great chamber, there he was, Nefreth. Trazin was utterly enamored and touched the preserved corpse only for it to shift. The corpse began moving, and it removed its death mask, and its true face made Trazin scream. Mephed Ran. The great deceiver stared back. A shard from the war in heaven was Nefreth, and now it was free. It thanked the two Necron. It had again deceived them, orchestrating its release by osmatic influence. Its release required two, one cunning enough to decipher the Asterium Mysteriosus cipher, and one reckless enough to ignore the layers of security put in place. The signal of Serenade had pushed Trezin to the extreme, and the projection of Vishani had coerced Oricon into breaking its mysteries. The two were horrified. Trezin grabbed the damaged Oricon and began to run. But Oricon stopped him. If the Shard of the Deceiver escaped, the galaxy would be doomed. They looked at each other, and the words didn't need to be said. The Infinite and the Divine stood side by side together and challenged a god. A worthy enemy is worth 100 tutors. Millions of years of rivalry had tuned and trained them both. The years of cunning, strategy, and outmaneuvering had forged Trezin and Oricon into some of the deadliest Necrons in the galaxy. Reawakening the guards around the tomb, the Infinite and the Divine combined their power and launched themselves at the Deceiver. A clash of titanic proportion ensued. To be at the very center of this battle, your mind would crumble from the sheer concophony of violence and power. Oricon utilized his significant mental capacity to command and coordinate the desperate army. And Trazin lunged in with his empathic obliterator, a weapon that could hurt the Gitan. 
tries to leap from body double to body double, even releasing numerous hordes from his collection. Gene stealers, humans, orcs, Eldari, and Necron were unleashed as sentient life together battled a god. Trazin and Orokin fought together with a skill and mastery that only two who truly knew each other could do. But it was still not enough. They had turned the tide many times, but the friends had been pushed back to the entrance. Their forms were damaged, and the hateful god was almost upon them. Trazin reached into his pocket dimension and drew out his most prized possession. The Eldari soul gem he had taken from the world of Serenade millennia ago. He gave it to Orokin, telling him to use it as a conduit to assume his etheric form. At the edge of death, holding on for dear life, Orokin concentrated, crushing the gem between his hands, and he began to glow. The power of a world's worth of souls flooded within him and as Trezin's screams were drowned out, an apotheosis had begun. A shining, godlike creature emerged. Orokin had transformed. This creature of blinding power strode up to the deceiver, a god versus god. It was almost overwhelming. Orokin saw the cosmic universe in a way no mortal creature could ever understand. To achieve the essence of real externality, whether of time or space or dimension, one must forget such things as organic life, good and evil, love and hate. A gnawing hunger gripped him, melancholy and hate flowed from him. As the utter contempt of a god watched insignificant ants crawl in the mud, Staring into the face permanently twisted into a grin, the face that had taken everything from the Necron tear, Orokin strode forward, and the new god shattered the deceiver. Trezin found the diviner in a corner, his battered legs drawn up to his chest, hands over his closed ocular, his entire frame from headdress to lashing tail, had turned black. It was not ash or burn marks. The interdimensional energies had fused the shadows to his necrodermis. Orican, have you suffered damage? There was no answer. My dear Orican. Trazin knelt and put a hand on his quaking shoulder plate. Don't touch me! The diviner wailed, trying to shrink back into the masonry. It's all right, friend. It's all right. Trezin held up his palms to show he was no threat. You have been through a shocking transition to be sure, but the danger has passed. Provided you are not suffering critical damage, I'm scrying you for injury or malfunction. Orokin said nothing, stared at the floor. Trezin ran a diagnostic scry, palm hovering around Orokin's cranium longer than the rest of his body careful not to intrude too far into the diviner's space. Thank your stars, Orican. Nothing irrecoverable. Few servos here and there, sundry damage to the electrolocation systems. A wonder there is not more, given how much energy you channeled. And likely some in-ground corruption. You may lose memories for a time, but they will come back. Is it gone? Trezin's mouth twitched, and he brought a tesseract labyrinth out of his dimensional pocket. Orokin shrank away. You tore the deceiver to pieces, dear rival. Sucked the energy of each shard dry before casting it off. And I was there to catch them before they could collect enough energy to flee. He tapped a finger on the labyrinth. There are five of these. So yes, it is gone. N not Orokin's vocal emitters dissolved into a burr of static for a moment. Talking about the deceiver. I want to know about the other one. Is it gone? Trezin paused. I do hope so, Arkan. I do hope so. Then he stood and offered a hand up. Come now, we must rebuild the Tesseract Vault and put these labyrinths within. A vault inside a vault, 
each shard in a separate labyrinth. Orokin nodded and took the hand. His body was stiff, one leg would not bend, and Trezin had support him so he could walk towards the ruined vault. We will leave the mysterious here, sealed inside, said Orokin, so none can find this place again. Indeed, said Trezin. He stopped, looked at the archivist with an eye that Trezin just noticed was temporarily burned blind. Make me an oath, an honor pact, that neither of us will come here again. He held out a forearm, fused to the point it could not move at the elbow servo. Agreed, said Trezin, gripping the forearm, the oath seal. The contents of this vault are too dangerous for anyone to possess. Especially us, said Orokin, and ambled towards the ruined vault. To reach it, they would need to cross a mountain of corpses. I see, said the deceiver shard. But it is time for more questions. What shall we be returning to in this session? Trezin dipped a hand in his dimensional pocket, drew out what appeared to be a small homunculus, a being no larger than Trezin's hand, that struggled in his grip. Radiance showed through the gaps in his fingers, as he held the creature out for the deceiver's inspection. It is small, said the deceiver. A shard of a shard, never were the nigh lack, known for stinginess. These are not simple to obtain, said Trazin, and we both know the risk I take in giving them to you at all. Yes. The deceiver laughed, the deep sound of it screamed out by Trazin's filters, so it would not upset his vitals. We would not want me tearing through this prison, would we? Trazin felt, at times, a measure of guilt about having told Orokin there were only five shards, for keeping one for himself. Entranced by the amount of power these ancient shards held, the knowledge they had the galaxy, and the knowledge of things impossible. An inadequate sacrifice, the deceiver said, long tongue curling over the plasma that dripped over its chin. What do you wish in return? The Great Rift, said Trazin. I wish to know about its properties. The Deceiver grinned. So you wish to close it? No, I wish to enter it. Sixty million years of existence. Stars have supernovaed. Civilizations have risen to their zenith and crumbled away. And yet Trazin and Orokin still exist. Still roam the galaxy, causing mischief and turmoil wherever they go. From their beginnings upon the Necrontier homeworld, they were born into wealth and luxury. Scions of two great dynasties, but that time was not one of ascendancy for the Necron tier. In the ashes of the civil wars and the war in heaven, Trezin and Orokin were surrounded by a bitter, ambitious people, whose days of glory seemed behind them. They checked every morning for the cancerous growths that were destined to kill them sending them to the venerated ancestors who had escaped the torment of the Necrontier's painful existence. A constant, looming anxiety. As the two grew to adulthood, they specialized and adapted, Trezin following heavily in the ideals of his wealthy, miserly dynasty, becoming a recorder of history, finding a love for those precious moments of drama and wonder. 
the weak of body Orokin rebelled against his dynasty's ideals, sharpening his mind and wit, delving into the very power of time itself. The two began to develop their view of the universe, something that had begun to define them and bring them into conflict. At the royal court they began to bicker and clash, butting heads over how they would handle events and situations. All of it changed with the arrival of the Catan. They offered immortality, revenge and freedom from pain, a choice their silent king could not refuse. Despite the lone voice of Orokin speaking against these so-called gods, the old and hunched Trezin feared losing his mind, his library of history and culture, but immortal life could preserve it forever. Trezin followed the Silent King's orders and dragged his rival Orokin and many others from their homes into the bio furnaces. As the two stepped into the fire, the pain was overwhelming. They emerged inside metallic prison bodies and a part of them had been lost. Even their memories of their life before were violated by the Catan. They were betrayed, altered, changed into a parody of their former selves. Their ambition to live, to innovate, to change had been taken from them. As immortals, the priorities and ambitions of both became galaxy spanning and upon their reawakening in the 30th millennium, their rivalry reignited, one to preserve and one to predict, one to look to the past and one to the future. Orokin had discovered something incredible, an etheric state in which he was free, he was evolved. The salvation and transformation, the future of the Necrons was his desire, so it did not matter how petty, spiteful or reckless he was, it was all in the name of grand purpose. Trezin had spent millennia collecting, adding creatures and cultures to the galleries on his world of solemnness, a magnum opus to be viewed by those who would appreciate the wonders the galaxy had to offer. He ever increasingly sought rarer, older, and specialized prizes for his grand collection, each piece added improving the beauty of his collective. The Asterium Mysterios and Nefret's tomb represented everything the two desired. They betrayed, beat, shot, insulted, and fought with each other for over 10,000 years even being forced to work together, discovering and unwinding their dislike for each other, understanding their justified and unjustified hate towards each other. Their journey's end at the tomb of Nefref was a horrifying revelation. They had once again been tricked by the deceiver, the creature they hated most in the galaxy. The two together fought like titans, challenging a god. As we all know, love and hate are closer than you would think, and so are rivalry and respect. Since the biotransference into Necrons, perhaps the Catan had taken away something more precious, the ability to change. The truth was there all along. The opposite of any bond is indifference. Trazin and Orokin have bickered, betrayed, and fought with each other for countless years, and yet they have saved the galaxy together. Perhaps they truly desire for this great game to continue, this bond that ties them to who they were in the time of flesh. With the shattered remnants of the true Data Mansa Vishani taken from Nefref's tomb, Orokin continues with his great plan, his path to the future of his race and his plans to exact the lessons Trezin so richly deserves. Despite giving his word, Trezin couldn't quite help himself, keeping a smaller shard of the Deceiver for himself. The Infinite couldn't let such a valuable piece be wasted. 
More pieces need to be collected, more secrets need to be harvested, and his quest for rarer specimens lead him into the Great Rift. What prizes await collection for his beautiful galleries? Conflict, mayhem, mischief, and petty bickering all await the infinite and the divine.